thank you michelle and good evening everyone on behalf of incredit equities i welcome all to this arman financial services pq up at 23 earnings conference call we have along with us mr alok patel who is joint managing director and mr vivek modi a group chief financial officer we are thankful to the management for allowing us this, this opportunity i would now like to hand it over to mr alok patel joint managing director of arman financial services for his opening remarks over to you alok thank you thank you so much jignesh uh, and on behalf of arman financial services i extend everybody a very warm welcome to our q3 and 9 months earning conference call for fiscal 23 with me as jignesh said i have vivek modi the group cfo and also representatives from our investor relations team i hope everyone has had an opportunity to go through the results press release and presentation for the quarter and the 9 months ended december 31st 22 which are uploaded on the stock exchanges and the company's website the global economy is progressively returning on a growth path as the western economies are gradually showing signs of recovery coupled with china lifting the covid-19 restrictions however this growth has also led to unexpected inflationary pressures and interest rate volatility amongst other factors amongst Amidst all this volatility, the Indian economy is on a strong footing. As per the recent budget announced by the Finance Minister, India's GDP is estimated to grow by 6.5% in FY24. The growth is attributed towards multiple growth drivers such as robust GST collections, rise in consumption level, and revival of the rural and semi-rural economies. Coming into the microfinance and microcredit industry, In the last two to three years, the industry has navigated the COVID-19 disruptions fairly well. Credit demand has also remained unaffected despite RBI's recent repo hike of 25 bips, taking the repo to 6.5 percent. Specifically for the quarter three and the nine months gone by, the credit demand in the sector has rebounded and the disbursement activities have picked up. which is an important positive for the country's economy the company too has witnessed healthy uptake in the credit owing to improving on ground recovery in the rural and semi rural markets in q3 fy23 the company registered a strong disbursement growth of 61.2% which stood at rupees 478 crore while the disbursements for the 9 months grew by 65.8% to rupees 1135 crores this improved rural and semi rural market demand coupled with implementation of company's new los and lms system has also aided our assets under management to grow by a solid 57.2% our assets under management as of 31st december stood at 1642 crores up from rupees 1045 crores over the same period last year at arman it is our constant endeavor to service the low income underserved people of the nation who have little to no access to the formal banking or the financial services system in this regard the company has started offering individual business loans or ibl to its graduating microfinance customers without any group guarantees and on an individual basis as on 31st december 22 ibl constituted 2.3% of our AUM the idea of the product is to retain and graduate good microfinance customers into individual higher ticket size loans with cashless repayment methodology and higher underwriting so far with this small portfolio we have a 100% repayment rate and 100% through cashless collections we have achieved another major milestone in the month of january where our microfinance business has been assigned the highest ever grading of MFI 1 by care ratings this is the highest possible grading of a MFI company and it validates their operational it validates our rather our operational and financial capabilities to undertake sustain and scale our operations this grading of mfi1 will not only help the company improve its borrowing profile but also lend confidence to all of our stakeholders of our ability to manage our operations at scale further our technological shift towards implementation of new los and lms system will enable us to improve our efficiencies 
lower the operational risk and enhance customer experiences. We are pleased to report that the entire microfinance process is now completely paperless, including the loan documentation using digital signatures. We were one of the first MFIs in the country to have 100% paperless loan originations. With immense opportunities unfolding in the MFI and MSME sector due to government's emphasis on rural and semi-rural India, the company is on track to scale its disbursements and achieve targeted AUMs while maintaining book quality and profitability in the coming quarters. Now coming to the financial highlights. As of 31st December, assets under management stood at 1,642 crores, registering a growth of 57.2% year-on-year and 14.4% quarter-on-quarter. Of the 1,642 crores of AUM, 81% is contributed by the microfinance segment, 13% by the MSME segment, 4% by the two-wheeler segment, and 2% by the new individual business loans. During the quarter, the company's disbursement increased by 61.2% year-on-year and 72% quarter-on-quarter, totaling 478 crores. Disbursement for the nine months stood at 1135 crores. <clears throat> this disbursement growth was supported by high demand in the microfinance segment. MFI disbursement for the third quarter stood at 406 crores, registering a growth of 68.8% year-on-year and 83.5% quarter-on-quarter. The gross total income for the company stood at 103 crores, registering a growth of 75.6% YOY and 11.2% Q1Q. This growth was supported by improvements of yields in the MFI segment. Our NIMS for the quarter stood at 14.8%. Company's pre provision operating profit stood at 38 crores, registering a healthy growth of 206% year over year and 10.3% uh, uh, Q over Q. And profit after tax tripled and has recorded the highest ever profit during the quarter to rupees 22 crores. On a consolidated basis, GNPA stood at 3.37%, and net NPA was almost negligible at 0.15% showing an improvement of 100 basis points and 50 basis points, respectively, from March 22. This was on account to improvement in collection efforts and increased asset quality post-COVID. Cumulative provisions stood at 70 crores, covering 4.6% of the on-book portfolio, of which provisions, and standalone bus provisions for the standalone business stood at 15 crores, and for the subsidiary number stood at 55 crores. The collection efficiency has been improving steadily on the back of economic and business growth. Overall, collection efficiency stood at 98.3% in January, uh, this current January of 23. Collection efficiency for January 23 for various segments stood as follows. Microfinance segment, 98.4%, MSME segment, 98.1%, and two-wheeler segment, 96.5%. At present, we have presence in eight states with a comprehensive branch network of 321 and a workforce of 2,857 team members. Of all the states, Gujarat contributes 29% to the, percent to the AUM, followed by Uttar Pradesh at 23%, Madhya Pradesh at 16%, 10% each in Maharashtra and Rajasthan, and the balance in other newer states like Haryana and Bihar. The company has recently forayed, forayed into two new states of Bihar and Haryana. We will continue to focus on extending our presence in newer districts in existing states while also exploring opportunities in new states as well. <laughs> Coming to the borrowing profile and liquidity, as on 31st December, the company had total borrowings worth 1,518 crores. This, ex this is excluding the debt component split of the OCPRS and CCD as per India's of 53 crores. Of the total borrowings, approximately 29% is through banks, 24 through NBFCs, 16% through securitizations, which is the PTC route, 16% through NCDs, and the rest is borrowed through BFIs, ECBs, and direct assignments. As on 
31st December, the company has a healthy liquidity position of 285 crores of cash and bank balances, liquid investments and undrawn CC limits. Additionally, the company has 31 crores of undrawn sanctions from existing lenders. As per NDS, which includes this equity split component of the CCDs and OCRPS, the company's equity stood at 332 crores with a debt-to-equity ratio of 3.6x. On a fully diluted basis, assuming full conversions of all convertible instruments within the next 15 months, the total equity base stands at 383 crores. With the recent fundraise, the company's well-capitalized capital adequacy for Arman stood at 48%, while the subsidiary number stood at 21.6%. We believe the worst is behind us and we are well poised to achieve growth and harvest the benefits of fairer weather. Our focus will be on scaling up disbursements in a calibrated manner. Having said that, said that I must also mention that our larger interest will be to build profitability and maintain quality of our loan book over the coming quarters and years. Thank you very much and I would request Michelle to open the floor up for any questions and answers. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, sir. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may please press star and one on the attached on phone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We have the first question from the line of Amit Mantri from 2.2 Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, Alok. Uh, congratulations on the strong growth in this quarter. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Amit. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. So just a few, yeah. a few questions. Uh, so one, uh, the finance costs have increased significantly uh, quarter on quarter. Is this because of the, the interest portion on the equity that has been raised uh, in the last quarter? So, yeah, a combination of both, uh, uh, Amit. One is the interest on the CCDs and the provision on, OCR, provision yeah. on the OCRPS. So, those have added to the burden in this quarter specifically to Arman mm -hmm. uh, standalone. Mm -hmm. And also the interest rates, unfortunately, due to the uh, consistent repo rate increases by the RBI, there is some level of, uh, you know, pressure on the interest rates as well sure. uh, by about 70, 80 base, basis points on a weighted average, which is quite a large jump on a quarter to quarter. But uh, I think about 5 crores of uh, the interest uh, expense, I believe, Vivek, correct me yeah. if I'm wrong, is uh, is related to the OCRPS and the equity part. The right. equity, yeah. Uh, and additionally, Amit, uh, if I can also add, uh, uh, as we uh, kind of uh, keep on increasing our disbursements, it's important for us to also maintain a slightly higher level of liquidity. And the additional liquidity anyway will have a bit of higher uh, level of, uh, you know, sure. uh, overall uh, financial outflow. Correct. So there will be, I think, specifically also in Q4, there will be slightly higher uh, carry cost because... Uh, we are expecting to carry uh, slightly more amount of cash in, uh, in on March 31st to service the you know somewhat slower uh, uh, debt volumes in the first quarter, which is usually the trend. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And uh, so, so there's some direct assignment that was done in this quarter. What was the size of that transaction? Sorry, uh, the debt assignment. Uh, the so uh, that's about 100 crores. 100 crores. So in in this uh, this transaction, so the the value in the PNL, uh, the gain has been around 6.6 .6 crores. And for the same 100 crores, uh, when it was done a year back or January 2022, uh, around, the gain was around 5.8 crores. So are we now receiving better spreads on the direct assignment versus uh, a year back? Yeah, you're right. Um, uh, to compliment you, you on your ability to analyze that one, 
but uh, yes, we're getting uh, a lower MRR, uh, uh, which is like the, the retention ratio, ratio against the last one has come down. So that kind of adds, uh, makes are, it there, slightly more profitable. There are other and factors as well, and like the weighted average tenors of the assets yeah. sold and things like that also make a difference. Mm. Sure, sure. Okay. And um, my last question, so the, in the MFI, the asset quality has deteriorated from 3% to 3.3% uh, sequentially. So uh, what's the reason for that? On so, the MFI side, you are saying? Yeah, the, in Namra business. In the, so partially, uh, uh, you know, the, the, gla the overall impact is about less than 0.15 or something. So... Uh, you know, now as we keep on moving to the more uh, average kind of a scenario, I think uh, it will slowly but surely come down, but likely to kind of... Uh, there is a slight bit of a pressure, uh, especially in areas of Maharashtra, uh, in Western Maharashtra. That is what you are seeing as a blip, but it's well under control. Okay. okay. Thank you and good luck to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sahil Sharma from SS Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, sir. Congratulations for great numbers. Uh, the first thing I wanted to understand, sir, is especially for our MFI loans, do you track or have information on the end uses that customers put these loans into? For example, at least from my understanding, a large percentage go into dairy or you know, uh, dairy animal-related activities like milk, harvesting and selling, and is that your understanding too, and do you have some rough breakup of how these loans are utilized in MFI? I mean, you are absolutely correct. We do track the end use uh, when giving, when originating the loans. Uh, we do try to track the end use specifically, and yes, a large portion does go into things like Allied Agri, which is almost 35-40% of the portfolio. That includes cattle, uh, exact breakouts, uh, if you if you email the investor relations team, we'll get it out because there is a very large variety of occupations that our customers enter into. Uh, now, one thing about end use you have to understand about microfinance customers is that typically these guys don't have like separate bank accounts for business and, you know, their personal use. Whatever money that is incoming is going into one pocket and whether it's so once it all mixes up, it's very hard to keep a track of, uh, you know, something like cattle, you can always go later and see whether they have bought a cattle. But if they are using it for, let's say, a Kirana store uh, uh, for buying inventory, it's, it's, it's hard to track that. We try to do a good job, but there is not a, there is no foolproof mechanism to track once you disperse the money. Uh, but it's it's usually on a best effort basis. Uh, okay, sir. Thank you so much. I will uh, uh, email the IR for the breakup. My second question is, sir, we see that the GNPA has gone up a little bit in this quarter. So are we seeing any uh, problems on asset quality or is this more like a small variation and we shouldn't read too much into it? So it's, a, it's, a, it's a small blip. It's a small variation. I wouldn't put too much emphasis in it. But as I told uh, Amit, who was the last question guy, there was a small blip which has happened in Maharashtra, which might be put and in the uh, And the additionally, what has happened is the uh, quarter uh, three, the new RBI guidelines were in, uh, yeah. uh, you know, the uh, 90 plus DPD. Uh, once it goes into 90 plus DPD and gets classified as NPA, stays as NPA. Correct. Uh, so that kind of has further increased it by about uh, 20 basis points. Yeah, I, sorry, I think that's, I, I completely forgot about that. Thank you so much. Yes. So largely so, we can uh, add to it uh, because this, uh, this, is, this was a regular uh, concern also. I think since we are now absolutely aligned to the RBI's uh, new guideline, so the overall impact is not more than about 0.2% uh, on the overall NPS for the company. Right. And just to kind of elaborate on what this new RBI policy says, although I'm sure most of uh, the listeners are aware, uh, earlier what was the situation was once an asset cost 90 days, it was considered as an NPA. But if it went down to, let's say, 80 days past due, then it would be 
you know, back again as non-NPA. What the new RBI guideline says is that once an asset becomes NPA, which means it crosses 90 days in our case, it will continue to remain an NPA until the DPDs are zero. So that means even if a customer pays you two installments and goes down to 30 days past due, it would still be an NPA until the account is completely uh, cleared and zero. So yeah, that has also caused uh, you know about a 20 bit increase in the overall NPA recognition. Nothing has really changed in that case. It's just the mechanism of classification. Okay, thank you so much, sir. All the best. Thanks. Thank you. A reminder to all the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may please press star in one now. The next question is from the line of Parth Basani from KK Advisors. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hello, sir. Uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, I mean, as our uh, top three states contributes roughly around 60% of our EUN, so do we plan to de-risk the same going forward? So, I mean, I think, like, if you... Our constant endeavor has to was to reduce our geographical concentration. So, if you look at, let's say, in March of 2017, 80% of our portfolio was only in one state, which is Gujarat. So we have come kind of a long way to diversify that. We are in eight states right now. Uh, Bihar and Haryana were new states. Obviously, the uh, overall portfolio of Rajasthan, which we entered into a couple of years ago, is increasing. Uh, so I think overall concentration in the top three states, you should see it going down. By what percentage, it will be hard for me to predict at this point. Uh, but I think uh, it has continued to come down as time goes on and it will continue, the concentration risk will continue to come down as we go forward as well. Okay, okay. okay. And uh, uh, how are the new geographies of uh, Haryana and Bihar performing? Is there any love Bihar is doing excellently. Uh, huh. uh, Haryana is doing fine as well, but a little slow uh, as far as the growth is concerned. Uh, but Bihar is uh, surprisingly much, uh, much even much better than our own anticipation. So that would that continues to be the case. Oh. Okay, great, great. Okay, sir, uh, that's it for now. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Participants, you may press star and one to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Alok Shah from Srinath Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, so, I just had two questions. Uh, first was with funds coming in, what kind of growth are we expecting for FY24? Uh, we typically don't give uh, growth targets, Alok. Uh, typically, we target somewhere between 35 to 40 percent growth on a long term CAGR basis. So, uh, it would be similar to somewhere around that neighborhood uh, in the coming year. Okay. And uh, so, what kind of leverage are we comfortable with? Typically, we try not to go beyond 5x on a debt equity ratio. Okay. That is not so to right. say we never did below that. Uh, <laughs> case in point, like right before we raised these funds, but uh, typically we try not to go, uh, you know, above 5x. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. That's it for me. Thank you. Before we take the next question, a reminder to all the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one now. We have the next question from the line of Devendra Pandey from DP Financial Advisory Services. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, sir. So my first question is on our MSME segment. So the government has announced various schemes and initiatives for the MSME scheme over the last few years. So what is our strategy here and what kind of growth are we targeting in this segment? So, I mean, most of the schemes that are arranged by the government, typically we don't apply for it because, you know, MSME is a very, very broad term. It can include a 1 lakh rupee loan. It can include a 
you know, 10 lakh rupee loan and it can also include a 5 crore loan. So, uh, but there has been some movement, uh, you know, backed by CDB of getting, you know, these low-scale MSME workers into, uh, what is it called, with a or, uh, or something along yeah. those lines. So, I mean, there are multiple schemes, but one of the schemes is... Uh, yeah, so to get them on. But usually we don't, or our customers don't qualify for many of these MSME schemes. Uh, that being said, we are growing steadily in the MSME segment. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a segment that is performing very, very well for us uh, specifically, uh, given, uh, you know, its profitability, its margins, and uh, even its asset quality, which is not very, very different from uh, microfinance space. So it's a slightly higher operating cost are, are there in that, but uh, the margins more than offset it. Uh, the only thing in that segment is, is you have to grow very carefully. You have to understand the customer and their businesses. So that very quick growth that people are used to seeing in MFI segment that we have come to realize is uh, difficult or slightly, uh, I don't want to say dangerous, but... Uh, uh, it's better to be avoided in that segment. You want to grow carefully. Uh, so uh, we are we are very bullish on that segment. Uh, but uh, you know the kind of growth that is possible in JLG microfinance is uh, it will be hard to catch up in in MSME in the short term. Uh, but in the long run, we feel that MSME will uh, overtake microfinance in you know if you visualize three to five years or five to seven years down the road. Got it, got it. And sir, uh, what is our uh, average cost of borrowing as of nine months? Mm, well, uh, for the consolidated, it will be turned out about uh, 12.75 to 13. And uh, how much we expect it to remain in the range uh, for the next two, three quarters? We'll try to maintain it here or maybe about might expect another 25 yes. dipping so, uh, so it's a, I mean, uh, it's dependent on a lot of, uh, uh, you know, environmental factors. One, we've started to see that uh, as we kind of, uh, Alo, just shared with you, that uh, for number of finance, we are already uh, being graded as MFI 1. So that yeah. does get us a better credit rating with most of the lenders. So that could see some bit of softening uh, from most of the existing lenders. Along with that, uh, generally it is seen that uh, uh, the interest rate seems to be kind of topping out uh, for at least for us. Uh, as the interest resets happen for some of the loans that have not seen the interest reset, uh, it might push that up. So on an average, I think we are trying to maintain this uh, at this level only and hope uh, we are kind of successful uh, doing that in the next couple of quarters. Got it. Got it. And are we able to pass on this increase in average cost of borrowing to our end customers? Yeah, thankfully, due to the new RBI guidelines that were issued in March of 22, uh, obviously the larger than the margins that you are seeing are as a result of that. And yeah, are able to pass it on to our customers, uh, so far at least. So can we expect the yields to remain in the similar range um, for the next few quarters at least? Yes, yes. Or do we expect it to increase a bit? It will likely increase a bit the older, uh, you know, lower, uh, lower interest portfolio kind of uh, runs out and is replaced by slightly higher margin portfolios. So uh, not there is not a lot of that portfolio left, uh, but you can increase some. You can expect some marginal increases in the name. Got it. Got. Thank you, sir. That's all from us. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Amit Chodia from World Foods. Please go ahead. 
I I wanted to understand the gross total income has gone up by seventy two percent, but the PAT has moved up by two seventy three percent. So, could you help in understanding uh, the margin expansion? Uh, well, uh, uh, you know, uh, the PAT uh, is dependent on a lot of other factors. So, while the revenue has increased uh, as we come out of COVID, overall provisioning. requirement has gone down considerably uh, additionally the cost of funds the the, the min effect would also uh, play out in fact that our uh, you know uh, profitability keeps on increasing uh, so so that is as much a function of the leverage so i think if you look at our uh, if i understood the question correctly it wasn't very very uh, audible Uh, but if you are talking specifically of our margin see if you look at our employee cost and stuff like that uh, they have not increased as much as the portfolio has increased so we are gaining some uh, efficiencies as far as our staff, staff cost and everything is concerned okay. and uh, provisions have also uh, gone down significantly uh, which were you know higher due to covid now they are getting back to somewhat normal see Uh, so all of those things will have a impact uh, to the overall margins does does that did that answer your question i'm sorry i didn't quite understand your question yeah i got i got my answer and my second question was uh, at 2500 i'm sorry to interrupt sir would you i would request you to use your handset to ask a question So the current participant has left the queue. We will move on to the next question, which is from the line of Kune Gilani from Vivriti AMC. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, hi, hello, hi, Vivek. Uh, so a question on uh, your ticket sizes. We've uh, seen the ticket sizes over the last 12 months or so uh, increase. Uh, this is on the MFI. Uh, seeing that increasing from about 36,000 to 46,000 in one of the slides. Uh, and just trying to understand is this a reason uh, on account of maybe higher cycle of customers or is it because of the new guidelines which is allowing you to be a bigger part of the balance sheet of your customer or are you able to underwrite uh, more uh, with better conviction to to be pro- offering high ticket sizes just trying to understand you know what are the factors that are going into uh, that number going up no I, so i think there are three or four factors uh factor number 1 is of course uh, as the customer shift from a lower cycle to higher cycle uh, as you said correctly the, the 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 ticket size on average does go up uh, number 2 i think the slide which you are looking at which is talking about from 36 to 46000 uh, that was uh, in september of 22 which we were being slightly more conservative due to covid you know first wave second wave third wave and those things kind of coming in so artificially we had reduced our ticket sizes into something that we were not so comfortable with and third thing is about the fact that uh, like it or not this is the industry trend overall we are our average ticket sizes seem to be slightly lower than the industry average and uh, the general trend and the tendency in the industry has been to increase ticket sizes now uh, you know as far as things like interest rates our customers are not very sensitive they are more sensitive to things like ticket sizes and turn around uh, to turn around times so if you want to be in the market we cannot be a complete outlier in the lower end so we always have to balance the ticket sizes according to what is kind of ongoing in the market and uh, finally also uh, to give you a little bit more comfort around this fact see almost 10 to 15% of the customers have kind of left microfinance uh, because uh, during covid they had a default or an overdue we are not servicing the customers but whatever is customers are left after removing the Uh, are, are the type of customers that repaid during us or repaid whoever else during covid also right yes. and so can you afford to take a slightly higher risk on these customers 
I would say yes, probably you can. And really, the proof is in the pudding. I think uh, the overall uh, default rates that we observe are not. I mean, if you look at our data, and this is going into slightly more detail than you probably want. But if you look at our data of you know current default, post-COVID default rates, there is not much of a correlation between the ticket sizes and the you know the chance of default or chance of overdue. Understood. That, that, that is, yeah, that's very helpful. My second question was uh, on the uh, the capital structure and. Uh, uh, of course, with the, with the uh, equity raise, uh, the position has become a lot more stronger. Uh, but of course, on account of accounting-related considerations, part of the uh, sort of the capital is recognized as not truly as as equity, right? So there, uh, what have been the conversations like with investors in terms of convertibility, in terms of what kind of timelines we are tracking uh, for that? Okay. Majority, majority of these. Uh, majority of these instruments were in the form of CCDs. 76 yeah. crores is a CCD. It's CCD. So they are compulsory convertible. So they are tier one equity and uh, they'll convert in another 13 and a half months or so. If I'm, uh, yeah, so uh, I mean, the hard line will be a, a couple of days before March 24. Yeah, March 24. Will, is, that's when they'll convert. Uh, as far as the OCRPS is concerned, that is about 38 crores. Uh, see, the the issue price was 1230. Uh, today's price is somewhere around 1800 or, uh, excuse me, 1500 or plus or minus. Not seen it today, but uh, the, if it's, you know, it just depends on what really the price is at the time of conversion. I have not really talked to any of the investors. It's too early to talk to them. Uh, but we'll see. You know, it's. Uh, uh, I'm not too worried about it. Let's just put it that way. Wonderful. Great to hear that. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, wishing you very best for the coming quarter. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you sir. Participants, you may press star and one to ask a question. The next question is from the line of Shubham Ajmera from SOIC Ventures LLP. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi, sir. Thanks for providing me the opportunity. Uh, sir, I had a few questions on the cost of fund side. So in the current quarter, as you mentioned, increase in finance cost, uh, and one part of that is due to CCD or OCRP. So can you please share the how much cost is due to the, the like quantum of amount? And also, if you can share, like, it would be a one-time, one-quarterly impact, or, like, it would be going forward in the same manner? No, I mean, I I think I mentioned it was approximately 5 crore. Exact amount, I don't recall. But, yes, uh, this but, will continue uh, for uh, for the uh, period uh, the CCD is finally converted. So, yeah. for whatever, another 13 and a half months. So, you have, you have uh, I think, about 3 crores will be Vivek uh, for, for the CCD. CCD is an, uh, uh, and approximately uh, 2 crores. Maybe, for, uh, maybe slightly yeah, less, and less, I don't know. So let's say comfortably between four and a half to five crores. Exact figure, if you want, just email and we'll we'll send it out to you. Uh, and this will this will of course be for every quarter until they convert, which will be until March 24. But okay, uh, so see, the good part about equity five quarter, it will be the same. Yeah, but see, the good part about uh, equity is that immediately as soon as these instruments came in there was going to be an additional load because obviously we cannot leverage on the new equity right away. Within right? 90 days. Within 90, 90 days. days. So that was to be expected because this were going to have some load or some burden immediately. But as we keep leveraging on that uh, extra equity, uh, overall the extra burden will be far offset by the extra income that we generate on the whatever, 5x that, yeah, that, like that, that we like leverage that. on that 115 crore, right? I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, understood, understood. And, sir, after this improvement in the credit rating, so can the cost of borrowing will come down, like, by how much basis points it can come down? It's hard to tell, yeah. It's yeah. hard to predict. Really, honestly, it's... Uh, 
it's it's always a ma- it's 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 always a function of supply and demand uh, more and more that we do this and even banks and financial institutions realize that uh you know that uh, once now that the margin caps are removed uh they are they are also uh anxious to try to increase their own margins so uh, you know it's it's always a function of negotiation and supply and demand but the more offers that we have from uh people offering us debt the more in a position of negotiation will be so with things like ratings and gradings and other factors the uh the, the hope is that you are in a better negotiating spot uh, uh with with the uh, with the lenders you know and in that way it will result in a slightly decreased cost of borrowing uh, but whether that gets offset by consistent increases in the repo rate by rbi there are too many variables too many things to really predict or uh, down to the basis points of how much it will reduce or increase in the future yeah got it got it and then my last question is on this interest income part so our disbursement during the quarter has been increased by around 70% uh, but on qq basis our interest income is uh, up by only 4% only so like what could be the reason for this so i mean disbursements and uh, income correlation will be hard for you to do because you know the disbursements will help us earn interest income for a period of 2 years so i don't think it's an apple did i did i understand the question wrong i don't think it's an apples to apples comparison so, uh, one uh, answer to that is absolutely it's not an apple to apple comparison the second part is uh, Uh, are you just looking at the uh, interest income alone or are we also looking at uh, uh, the income generated from uh, the sell of portfolio because there has been a sell of portfolio that has happened in number which has got 100 crores so from that aspect uh, 6 crores yeah, actually are looking at interest income alone yeah so so because when you sell off the portfolio uh, then the interest income does not get into the i mean the in, the interest income that you will be able to generate has already been taken into the uh, you know gain on sale of the portfolio yes. okay got it yeah got it the income is upfront oh thank you thank you so much thank you a reminder to all the participants anyone who wishes to ask a question may please press star and one now The next question is from the line of Akshay Doshi from Incred Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity. So, my first question is that: uh, Do we have any co-lending arrangement as of now? We do not have any co-lending arrangement as of today, sir. Okay. So, any plans to venture into that? Um. So, let me put it this way. Uh, the purpose of getting into co-lending can be a lot of reasons uh, primarily people enter into co-lending because uh, you know it allows them to not worry about fundraising for example both equity and debt or they don't have to dilute or they don't have to leverage their own funds and they can rely on a larger bank or something to do it so for us we don't face those problems so purely on a commercial basis if there is a opportunity available on co lending or on bc or something we are happy to explore it uh, but not for the first two reasons which i gave and uh, sir the question is uh, i'm sorry to interrupt mr doshi your voice is breaking uh, may i request you to please use your handset to ask a question Would that uh, our mix of lending uh, going ahead would be? Uh, I, I like uh, I uh, like are are we planning to add new products like personal loans etc to our portfolio? 
I, I missed the first part of your question because your voice was not audible. The part yes, which I so got was that uh, whether yeah. we are planning to add any more products. Yeah, yeah. Complimentary, yes, yes. complimentary products like IBL and stuff we have added. MSME is something that we added in 2017. Uh, you know, obviously, I hate to say it, but, you know, micro lap has been on a kind of a to-do list since pre-COVID. Finally, now that things are stabilized, something that we can consider down the line. Uh, but it's always, as you know, running an NBFC, it's always uh, nice to balance between the number of products you have. I mean, you don't want to be a jack of all trades. You need to find like a niche product that you are good at. Like, you know, you are not a bank where you can do 20 different products uh, and... Uh, so as an NBFC, it's 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 always important to find a good balance between number of products that you do and how many of them you do really well. Okay, okay, sir, understood. Uh, sir, and my third question is that uh, also we have been increasing our digital mechanism. So uh, does our underwriting methods have witnessed any improvement due to this uh, digital innovation? Yes, yes. I think uh, in the presentation and in the other stuff, I think we did mention uh, uh, all the, you know, benefits that we are getting from it. Uh, just to name a few, let me just open up. Uh, so we are using, for example, facial recognition. Uh, with the ML for the KYC documents. Uh, there is a KYC OCR verification directly done with their OCR pictures. Uh, we are using penny drops for a bank account verification, voter ID verification. Every step of the way, we are geotagging. Uh, there is a center risk categorization. We are using e-signatures. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of uh, cool new tools that are available to us now that uh, will reduce the tap and also reduce the overall risk in underwriting, especially due to, uh, you know, there is auto algorithms to uh, go through their credit bureau system. So, you know, 80% of our customers, the, uh, the, the, the credit bureau data is not even seen by a human. It's auto approved by a computer. So there are a lot of uh, benefits that we have gained, and over, overall the turnover time has reduced already by about two days. Okay, okay, so it's a great to hear from you, and uh, that was very helpful. So all the best, and uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Savi Jain from 2.2 Capital Advisors. Please go ahead. Hello. Yeah, hi, sorry. Hi. I just have this question on MSME lending rates, which are, which are around 36%. Now, there are money lenders, uh, you know, in every town and every district who lend at about 40% uh, without, you know, any kind of income assessment or any documentation. So how exactly are you competing with these guys uh, despite, you know, your... On the rest process, it's not it's not thirty six percent, sir. It's so so again, uh, sir. When when thirty six on the yield, it includes the uh, processing fees, the penalties, and all of the other things. So uh, uh, that's how it kind of uh, the, the yield the, the yield kind of looks high. But again, I think the competition definitely uh, is not with the money lenders that you kind of talk about because when uh, we are getting into structured msme the way we have been there for last 20 uh, for last 5 years or so it's about the entire predictive mechanism uh, and the engagement with the customer that is more important that's why they keep on coming back to us or kind of have, we have this engagement uh, that can, keeps on running into multi uh, cycles with the customers so why would they want more engagement? They want faster turnaround and lower rates. So if your rates are not very different, then are you getting like subprime customers whom even the money lenders are not willing to lend to because the rates are not really very different, right? 
So uh, I, I I would not sorry I will not be able to comment on what the money lenders are charging. My guesstimate is that uh, it's a very different world uh, when it comes to money lender. I can I can comment it. It's typically five to ten percent a month. So you are talking about sixty to one twenty percent. It's no less. It's not less than five percent. I don't know what it is in Maharashtra, but at least in Gujarat that is what the current rate is. Uh, Largely speaking, Savi, the our customers are not very very price sensitive, and uh, we don't really compete so much on the interest rates. It's as you said, it's the availability of funds. Uh, certainly, our rejection rates are north of 70 percent uh, even today, uh, and that is a provable fact. So, uh, I I would say that we are cherry picking, not sub priming. uh so th- that is just the reality of the market in today's scenario uh and i think you know the microfinance rate before the overall uh rbi ne- law came up in 2013 uh, that was no different that was still about 35 to 36% on an irr basis so uh typically speaking customers more are attuned to understand flat rates and if you calculate on a flat rate basis it turns out to be about 15 to uh, 16% and that is something that the customers are willing to pay now if there is ever a circumstance where uh the market is demanding for me to cut my rate you know i have said it openly i'm happy to cut it uh there is just no require i i do not see a requirement today but as competition increases we might be required to cut our rate and you know given the margins there is probably room to cut it as well just today i don't see the need uh to be a little blunt i guess and uh, one thing you know i was uh, like i don't know if you've been following jeevan but they are seeing huge recoveries on loans that they had written off and you know as a result they are having like net uh, zero cred- credit cost for s- some quarters now so are you also seeing some recoveries on 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 loans that you wrote off some time back well in the msme book we are sit- so in the arman book Arman. we are it's a kind of a you know so what, what you are saying is uh, negative yeah. impairment cost right now uh, so uh, what you are saying is true even in the number of book we are collecting but uh, you know not as much as we are providing or writing off as of today so uh, you know you reporting an almost net zero and npa no aside of these specific provisions towards npa what how much extra provision do you have including standard asset provision so there is no standard anymore it's all ecl yeah yeah ecl Yeah. It's all ECL, and so over and we make uh, so, so about one point two percent, three one one and a half percent. Largely, if you kind of uh, since our NPAs are hundred percent provided for, uh, and uh, our NPAs kind of turn out to be about fifty odd crores, both the organizations together, uh, the balance about twenty crores uh, stands as the standard asset provisioning, which is about one point seven five or one point five. right so it's about 4.6 is the total uh, cumulative provisions against the gross np of 3.37 so balance so one balance would be about what is it 1.3% or something was, was this number higher before pre covid or lower sorry no it was lower no yeah. i mean pre covid to <laughs> our nps were less than 1% <laughs> yeah So, so, so pre-COVID was, uh, you know, microfinance uh, in particular was a very uh, different, uh, you know, uh, regime because the entire sector probably was uh, reporting less than one and a half percent of NPAs. We were in March 2020, our GSPA in uh, MFI was 0.53 percent. And the and the hope always is uh, yeah, that Sabi that we. stock away for a rainy day so i don't expect this number to go down in fact it might go up
the provisions this was your provision quarter quarter and quarter have are still increasing so it's uh, basically more of uh, standard provisioning rather than uh, np provisioning uh, some combination thereof so i think uh, overall specifically for microfinance uh, you know 2 2.5% uh, kind of loan loss is something that uh, you would have to expect going down the road Oh, right. So even in forget about COVID, but even in our current book, which is, uh, you know, about I think what is it, post-COVID book, which is fifteen hundred crores or something like that. So even in that, you'll be even on that, you have to expect about a annualized two and a half, two two and a half percent cost on a, uh, you know, on a on an annual basis. Oh. How much of your liability was MLD, and what will the what will be the impact now because of this budget? You know MLD, I I don't know how much. So of, uh, the total MLD, uh, which are uh, largely uh, in the MLD structure, would be about forty five uh, crores in all. Uh, but uh, in terms of the overall impact, since. Uh, We've already issued. We don't really see any impact because we have to pay the interest that we have to pay the interest regardless of what the tax regime is. As far as the future uh, investments or uh, the you know uh, the interest of the market in MLDs uh, is yet to be seen. So right now, though, obviously, we do not see that uh, the investors would be coming back so easily or fast to the MLDs. But no, that's what is. It might as well be NTDs. Yeah. So it will be like more like an NTDs, yeah. but uh, so, the regular, regular, uh, you know, uh, taxation. And let's see if there is active interest and to what extent the active interest comes back. I don't foresee a lot of interest in the future. Okay. Yeah. Is there some uh, tightness in now the uh, sourcing liabilities? Uh, are you seeing yeah. some some kind of a pressure there? Uh, thankfully for us, no. I don't know about the market, but uh, we are okay so far. Touch wood. So you you don't have to calibrate your growth downwards based on availability of liabilities. Uh, as of today, no. Is there a chance that could happen in the future? I don't know, possibly, but uh, as of now, no. Okay. If this kind of relates to just the MLD kind of a thought, then I think uh, historically what we've tried to do is uh, diversify as much as possible on the liability side as well in terms of the products and the lenders uh, kind of buckets. And hence, uh, you know, if if one kind of a lender is not working out in a quarter or a half year. There are others who are kind of more than willing. So it's, it's having your eggs in multiple baskets so that there is more predictive uh, outcomes. Yeah, so the, the funds are typically available. Uh, it's just from what source, right? So, for example, during COVID, we got a lot of cheap funds from the DFIs. And so that helped us greatly to reduce our overall cost of borrowing. Uh, so now, I mean, it's being replaced by bank funds or NBFC funds, which are obviously not going to be as cheap as the NABAR, SIGBI, or Mudra funds, right? So uh, availability will be there, but from who is the question? Got it. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Kunal Kadam from Easy Mill. LLP. Yes, sir. Uh, um, at 2,500 crore AUM, what kind of revenues are we targeting and uh, what will be a sustainable financing margin at this volume? Say that again, at 2,500 crore AUM, what are we targeting? What kind of revenues are we targeting? What kind of revenue? Revenue are, revenue are we targeting? Yes. I, I'm sure we cannot really specifically answer that kind of a question, to be honest. I don't but, think I uh, can answer that. Uh, I'm sure we have projections built up, but whether that's disclosable or not. 
but largely if our ROAs and ROEs are any kind of uh, you know uh, guesstimations, uh, yeah. so I will leave it to the market to kind of uh, yeah. okay. right. So I would like probably assume that means would be constant and do your own calculations. I would assume a 14 to 15 percent NIM and then uh, go for, go forward from there. Okay. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. With that, we conclude today's conference call. On behalf of Incred Equities, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining.